Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast brought to you by PenFed. I'm your host, Heather Lucky Penny. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts to explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So you all know that here at the Mitchell Institute, we are huge fans of Air Force battle management. The combination of highly trained personnel and technology that makes sense of the combat environment, prioritizes and synchronizes combat operations, and ensures that our forces have the advantage in a dynamic battle space. Air Force battle management is a crucial function. It's different than the intelligence world, where folks generally think about broad scope issues on a time scale that can span months, weeks, or best case scenario, days. But battle managers focus on very specific lanes of the battle environment in windows of time that are generally span minutes and sec- seconds. They are tactically oriented, and they help teams on the ground and airmen in the sky, especially fighter and strike aircraft, understand how to best maximize desired effects while reducing those points of vulnerability. The roots of this community extend back to the early days of World War II in the Royal Air Force, where in highly trained personnel, They called them plotters, tracked data regarding the position of friendly and enemy aircraft that were gathered by radar and other sources. And these plotters mapped out the information on massive tables and coordinated the scrambling of air defense fighters to pull off effective and efficient air defense intercepts while attacking Luftwaffe forces. It's best remembered as a key part of the Battle of Britain. And this was really important because the RAF fighter force was really small after two decades of super austere budgets. Sound familiar, right? They didn't have the mass to simply have fighters patrol the entire sky over the United Kingdom. They needed to know exactly when and where to direct a really limited number of assets to get the job done. Now, this mission continued to evolve and advance throughout the Cold War. Technologies and practices became much more sophisticated, and they also became mobile in Vietnam, with aircraft like the EC-121 carrying battle managers and their sensors aloft to the edge of the battle space. We now best know them through their aircraft, the E-3 AWACS, and the recently retired E-8 J-STARS. The E-3 AWACS focuses on the air part of the mission, while the J-STARS on the ground targets. But it's not just about the planes and the onboard sensors and equipment, even though that's what we normally think of them. The battle managers are the capability who really make the difference. So what's the point of this episode? We're in the middle of a massive change regarding the operating environment. We all know the Pacific is huge and the threat is significant, but the technology is changing fast too. So just think about the implications of highly automated combat collaborative aircraft, or CCA, plus things like artificial intelligence, when it comes to command and controlling assets in combat. As the Air Force seeks to disaggregate nodes and capabilities in its operational systems, coordinating these functions will be even more essential to winning. We're seeing major changes in paradigms of how we've presented combat forces, and this is going to present challenges, and new requirements will emerge. It's a big deal. That said, core battle management tenants will endure. And that's what we're here to discuss. And we're lucky to have two battle management pros with us. The first is Lieutenant Colonel Alex Big Bobby Wallace, a regular on the Aerospace Advantage. He was an Air Force fellow with us a few years ago and is now the Director of Operations at the 728th Battle Management Control Squadron at Robbins Air Force Base. We've also got our current Air Force fellow, Lieutenant Colonel Grant Swat Georgilis, who just concluded commanding an E-3 AWACS squadron the 965th Airborne Air Control Squadron at Tinker Air Force Base. And just a note for our listeners, the views and comments from the Air Force active duty officers here on the Aerospace Advantage are their own and do not represent or reflect the views of the U.S. Air Force or the Department of Defense. Big Bobby, as always, fabulous to have you back. Glad to be back. Thanks for having me on, talking about one of my favorite subjects. (laughs) You got it. And SWAT, welcome. Hey, thanks. Lucky, great to be here. So first, I tried to lay this out in the opener, but I want you guys to weigh in because you're the experts. So how are you seeing the battle management career field and the mission overall evolving these days? You're both veterans of Afghanistan and Iraq, but now we're moving to a very different set of requirements. Yeah, thanks, Lucky. Great point. Like many of the missions within the Air Force, uh, battle management professionals uh, have had to pivot. Uh, Think about the Pacific, as most of the Air Force is doing as well. Um, And really about the near-peer problem sets that exist now when focusing on uh, someone like China. Additionally, we're going to have to do that by incorporating some outdated technology. So as you mentioned, both Big Bobby and I have spent time in Afghanistan and Iraq. I've also spent time shadowing the Russian forces up in Alaska, uh, working on CONUS ADIS uh, support missions. And most recently, I commanded an E3 deployment to Yukon, uh, reassuring Mm -hmm. allies and deterring escalating Russian aggression on the eastern flank. Mm -hmm. Largely, our battle management professionals have been asked to execute in a permissive environment where security was assumed. 
Dynamic mission changes resulted from sortie cancellations or tanker rerolls, as opposed to uh, actions from the adversary. As the temperature rises geopolitically, our battle managers are correctly focusing on how to orchestrate the active kinetic attainment of air superiority. However, with the lack of investment in our platforms, it's becoming exceedingly difficult uh, based on maintenance rates. Yeah, and uh, like you just, like SWAT, I've spent many hours on an E3 over the Middle East executing the coin fight. I also had the opportunity to deploy with JSTARS executing a very different mission set in the Indo-PACOM AOR. And in both cases, I couldn't agree more with SWAT on what our battle managers have been asked to do with the antiquated equipment that we've been given. Uh, both of these environments were relatively permissive and they allowed for ample opportunity to send data and often decisions back to the higher echelon uh, command elements. The world's changing. Our environment is no longer as permissive and time is not going to be in the same supply as it was in the coin fight in the Middle East. And for that reason, I think it's critical that we focus on making investments in the battle management platforms that will allow decisions to be made fast and at the edge of the battle space. That's going to be especially critical in the Pacific where time and geography put so much distance uh, between where our command elements may be and where we may be asked to execute. I think what, what you both said is really important because we need to understand that we failed to invest and continue to modernize uh, our battle management equipment Thank goodness we have battle management pros like yourselves who've been out there. But as we look towards the future, time is going to be, um, I think, really the decisive element. How quickly we can understand the environment, how quickly we can make decisions, and how quickly we can direct forces to areas where they'll be uh, effective. So we're in this area of change. But there's also constraints in any mission. So what are the enduring core requirements and realities that you all think will stay with battle management as we go through this transformation? For example, there are things that the RAF plotters did that folks uh, who managed SAGE for air defense in the Cold War did, and that battle managers still do today. What stayed the same, and what do you think will really evolve? Yeah, Lucky, I, I think there are four main areas that battle managers provide uh, to the Air Force, and I'll just kind of go through these here real quick and, and introduce them and provide a little definition. So information management, force management, integrated surveillance identification, and continuum of control. Information management is the collection, processing, dissemination of mission-relevant data needed for tactical and operational decisions. These are the genesis of the battle management processes. So think uh, as data is coming in from a higher echelon or from any type of mission planning, the ability to then take that in, make decisions off of that, and, and then act. Of course, uh, force management is the iterative planning process critical to force accountability. So force packaging, ensuring that the, the right aircraft are in the right place and the right time, and, and can do that in accordance with the risk that's been set up by the JFAC. Mm -hmm. Also, integrated surveillance identification. Uh, this, of course, is what yields the common operational picture. So we talked about some of those sensors uh, that you have on those platforms, uh, and that's going to give you that surveillance picture and then allow for battle managers to then run associated ID matrices, et cetera, to feed the fight. And then lastly, of course, the continuum of control. So that's battle managers that are able to uh, communicate with aircraft, direct the, their movements in accordance with risk, uh, and ensure that we have the right, right forces ready to go. Yeah, and Lucky, SWAT really nailed it there. And I want to emphasize a couple of points. You know, information management, I read a statistic when I was doing some research that said that between 2000, the year 2000, right before 9-11, uh -huh. all the way through 2015, there was some 4,000% increase in the amount of information collection entities that were in the battle space, pushing data out to uh, what had been generated in the DCGS. And you hit a point earlier, like Intel is a little bit different. It works in days, months, and weeks. The battle management information field has also blown up, and we have to make uh, we have to make our way through tons of data as well in that information management. Also, want to emphasize that force management is going to be huge. You mentioned austere budgets, limited resources. Our fighters and bombers are more exquisite and capable than ever, and we can't just churn them off the line like we did a la World War II style. And so, the management of those forces is sometimes, and, and I think, is absolutely going to make the difference in whether we come out of a fight uh, with the capability to fight the next day. It may not be whether we win or not, it'll be what we can present the next day too. And then I won't hit any more on the integrated surveillance. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that down the road. Um, but um, we have to consider now is where these new technologies, uh, things like AI, CCI, uh, CC, they're gonna augment these functions and these core competencies that battle, manager ha battle managers have and that make us more efficient and survivable. So what I'm hearing from you, and that statistic you said, 4,000% increase in data. I mean, really, that's a lot that you need to be able to, to gonculate, right, to be able to process and make meaning out of so that you can make uh, useful decisions and then control your forces appropriately. So I think that that's going to be a crucial element. But what you brought up, Bobby, about so the size of our forces, really, it's going to be not about necessarily protecting them so much as 
knowing how to position them for their maximum effectiveness, right? I mean, we do need to make sure that we preserve our, our, our war reserve material so we can continue to feed the fight for the next day. But if we're not effective today, we're just going to have to go back over the, uh, tomorrow to the same target set and the adversary will have responded and, and will be adaptive as well. Absolutely. It's positioning. It's the management. It's all the above. Battle managers are really at the heart and soul of making these things possible and really giving our combatant commanders and battlefield commanders options to bring the maximum effect to the adversary. So we've talked about how old and outdated a lot of the equipment is that you've been working with. Um, and you mentioned how artificial intelligence and some of these algorithms can help decrease the time it takes to, to crunch through all the data and the sensing that, that you're receiving. Where are we from a hardware perspective? Because the E8 JSTARS was sunset last year. And although the mission sensors are migrating to space, they're not fully there yet. So we got rid of the JSTARS, the consoles, the radios, uh, really the capacity to do that kind of battle management from the forward edge is gone. And what happened to the airmen that were tied to the J-STARS? Because that's really, again, like I said, where the magic comes from. It's the human cognition and the judgment that you bring to the battle space. And we all know that in the Air Force, Manning's tied to aircraft. So what's happened to those battle managers? You definitely hit it there. You know, we have uh, the Air Force definitely runs off of uh, wings and engines, and we base our manning profiles off of that. Um, thankfully, though, you know, we we survived through the sequestration. Well, I say we survived. We barely survived. Um, SWAT and I were both around in 2013 where we thought we were going to retire a lot of the E3 fleet, and we prematurely divested the airmen before we actually divested the iron. It's taken us over 10 years to recover from a, a career field, from a career field perspective, um, from that, I guess you would call it a mistake because we never got rid of the iron, but we got rid of the people. Um, and we lost a, a major cadre of folks that we are just now coming around to recovering from. Um, but thankfully this time around, we actually had some pretty savvy career field policymakers that made some sound decisions to retain C2 professionals and Good. distribute them uh, around the service. Many of those people now work in AOCs and in staff billets that are building the next generation of C2 mm -hmm. uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Many of these positions were ones that had been long neglected through the regular rated officer staffing process, for which I know you've heard me lament about many, many times from my time at AFPC. Um, and we've also leveraged some of these operators to stand up emerging mission areas on the active duty, uh, like the BCC at Robbins Air Force Base and a C2 detachment that we've just recently stood up out at Beale Air Force Base that also falls under the 461st ACW. So that reassures me because the wisdom, the experience that those battle managers bring to the fight is crucial. I mean, our combat capacity, those with the, the pointy noses, we really rely and depend on your ability to help orchestrate the fight, synchronize our, our effects, and point out the bad guys, right? Um, now, uh, SWAT, the E3 AWACS is also in a sunset period. So we know this can be replaced by the E7, but the most optimistic estimates for the Wedgetail's initial operating cap capability is 2027. So how is the Air Force preparing to be able to integrate Wedgetail into the force? Yeah, so... Just to pile on on the uh, you know divestment of aircraft, you know the E three also has divested. Six, we've had sixteen of those aircraft now divested. So mm -hmm. to pile on to the loss of consoles and radios, like Big Bobby talked about with the J Stars, that that's also happening within the AWACS community. We are working through some recapitalization. So you know the Air Force has agreed to purchase the E seven. So we're we're working through those acquisition timelines as well as for our CRC units, our ground based battle managers. The Tippy four will be brought on board to replace the aging uh, Tipsy seventy five. While these airframes uh, and systems on the ground show their age, the battle managers are still utilizing those to, to conduct good work. What we're having to work through, though, of course, is increasing maintenance rates that are mm -hmm. decreasing the efficiency of some of our flights. Um, it's also decreasing some of the capabilities of, of the ground-based systems that, that the wings are doing a good job of you know, working through and trying to figure out as we wait for the recapitalization efforts to actually show up on, on the line to the airmen. But like the E-8, the E-3 airmen uh, that associated with those divested aircraft are also being relocated. There's some good programs that are in place to try to outplace some of those individuals. Some of those have been sent over to J-STARS, uh, former J-STARS units, uh, to work on the BCC stand-up. So mm -hmm. that's been good for us to be able to retain that talent. Um, and then we have other options that are kind of in the fold right now, potentially looking at supplementing some guard positions there within the eastern air defense sector and the western air defense sector. So we'll see if that gets across the finish line. 
So bringing the E7 on board is going to be really important. Um, and, you know, having that battle management capability at the forward edge, I continue to contend having human cognition within the battle space will continue to be our asymmetric advantage. But fifth generation has often, I think, muddied the waters a little bit because of the incredible situational awareness that fifth generation aircraft to bring to the fight because they're able to do kind of some tactical management um, around their forces. So how have fifth generation aircraft shaped battle management? Fighters like the F-22 and the F-35 have access to these massive data streams and they're highly connected and they can understand the battle space in ways that legacy platforms could not, like, you know, what my old F-16 could see. So we often hear that um, fifth gen is more valuable for battle management than they are as fighters. How are their capabilities in this role complementary to what you bring to the fight? Fifth generation technology is going to be critical uh, for the Air Force in order to attain air superiority moving forward. I mean, my short time here at the Mitchell Institute, we know how important air superiority is, and, and we're constantly mm -hmm. advocating for that for that capability. Unfortunately, with the lack of recapitalization that we've kind of touched on, you know, the, the platforms that battle managers are operating from are, are not at that fifth generation technology yet. And so we're trying to get to the E7, trying to get to the TIP E4 in order to, to bring on those fifth generation capabilities in order to maximize uh, support to air combat in the future to attain uh, air superiority. But I think the commentary regarding the F-22 and F-35 as fifth generation platforms, uh, and then also some of the remarks of, hey, we can use these platforms as battle management platforms, is really a, a symptom of the last 30 years where air superiority was assumed. Uh, we had some uh, flexibility in the, in the capability uh, of those pilots on those platforms to use those exquisite sensors uh, to do some non-traditional things. We know that in the future against the near peer, we're going to need fifth gen fighters in order to to go and actually fight the adversary to gain their superiority, and they will not have the bandwidth that we've seen them use over the skies of Syria, for example. As a result, we will need to ensure that recapitalization efforts are fast-tracked as much as possible to ensure that our battle management platforms can support the achievement of air superiority moving forward in conjunction with our fifth-gen fighters. Yeah, so so the fighters, I mean, we know that um, the spectrum is going to be contested. Uh, so I think maybe they can fill important gaps in tactical control within their mission sets. And of course, the incredible data that they have in their sensors is going to provide greater superiority. But we still need to ensure that we're coordinating our broad theater-wide operations. And battle management will continue to be an important piece of that because, bottom line, fighters aren't battle managers. Yeah, that, that's correct, Lucky. Um, you know, from the time that the battle manager training starts at Tyndall, uh, they're steeped in those four tenets that we talked about that are key to, to battle management. And the, uniquely, uh, air battle managers in the Air Force are not just trained on their specific platform, like we see on the on the fighter uh, mm -hmm. side of the house mm -hmm. where you have an F-22 pilot or an F-35 pilot. They are the SME on that platform. Battle managers, uh, in, in comparison, are not just trained on their specific airframe, i.e. the E-3 or the J-STARS or the CRC, but also on the capabilities across the board with regards to air power. So they are they understand how to integrate uh, the the effects of both uh, fighter, bomber, MAF assets because they understand the capabilities and limitations of those aircraft and are then able to force package those together in order to achieve JFAC objectives. Uh, and important to note that, again, battle managers not more knowledgeable on each specific platform. So it's important in mission planning that that we're making those connections and developing those contracts that are mm -hmm. uh, that are mm -hmm. going to be needed for mission accomplishment. But uh, the capability that battle managers bring is the, is the ability to bring all those effects together. Yeah, you're the conductor for the orchestra. Bobby? Yeah, I, and I just wanted to pile on here. You know, as we've evolved battle management, you you mentioned fifth generation technology and uh -huh. and that that kind of myth of sorts that's out there that the fifth generation platforms can replace battle managers. I want to emphasize that the EC-121 didn't replace plotters or weapons directors when it showed up in the mid 1960s. And what it really allowed to do is technology then uh, demonstrated that it allowed a battle manager and a controller to actually scale up. And instead of controlling one aircraft against one objective new computing technology and SAGE and the EC-121 allowed one weapons director con to control multiple intercepts at a time and think about their follow-on actions, which up until that point in time hadn't been available. I would contend that fifth generation and beyond aircraft are going to do the same uh, for your battle managers. You know, just because you get a better wide receiver and a better quarterback doesn't mean you fire your offensive coordinator on a football team. <laughs> in fact, it just allows them to be more effective. And I think we're seeing the same thing now as the Air Force uh, makes investments in fifth generation technology, it would allow the folks on the E7, the BCC, the CRC to scale up their responsibilities and have a broader span of control for the battle space, going back to leveraging more effects faster at the edge and giving combatant commanders more options. 
Shaq. And I think like, you know, like we said before, I, I do believe that fifth generation will be able to be that that tactical control in those gaps and in those seams. But as you described, Big Bobby, scaling up and coordinating more dispersed, um, sync, you know, being able to synchronize all the different forces across the scope of the area that we'll have to respond to is going to be crucial. So let's talk about the force you're controlling, right? That's a beautiful segue, because that's evolving rapidly too. Air Force senior leadership is increasingly moving towards more disaggregated team concept, making that battle management problem more complex as they're putting unmanned aircraft to join traditional manned ones. And things like artificial intelligence and network tops will be significant players. So how could these disaggregated operations challenge how you're doing battle management? I mean, you're going to have to respond to this notion that what you're seeking to, to control is fundamentally different, and that's going to force you to evolve in some pretty fundamental ways. Absolutely. Um, disaggregated operations, they always insert some complexity into battle space situations. That's an edict that's as old as warfare itself. Um, you're always balancing, spreading out your forces uh, for survivability, and that comes at the expense of rapid and coordinated action. And, and this evolution is in many ways no different. We are, however, leveraging new comm methods and comm relay capabilities to allow battle managers to control assets across a wider space in a more calm degraded environment. Um, battle managers are also changing the data sets that we're used to working from, and we're getting a lot more comfortable instead of controlling off of our native sensor, which when I was a young battle manager growing up, we were told you always, you, you almost, you never pay attention to data that comes from somewhere else. You mm -hmm. only trust what mm -hmm. you see, where in this case, we're, we're getting more comfortable with trusting data that is coming to us from other sensors and other places over various comm methods. And this is where we're going to rely. And the fact that we have so many sensors out in the battle space yeah. now, and that we're getting more comfortable with this, is where we're going to have to rely um, on a lot more artificial intelligence to help us with the track identification and tracking and track building of this uh, information. And so just beyond building our tracks, AI is really going to help us to achieve a rapid combat identification, which lets us put weapons against it hmm. at risk levels that are going to be acceptable to senior leaders. You know, and Big Bobby, as you were talking, it also makes me think about we need to really be conscientious that when we talk about disaggregated capabilities and assembling those kill chains and assembling those mission packages, we have to think about where these assets are physically located in space. And so how far how how far they can see, um, how far they can communicate. And that's going to be a really important piece of ensuring that we can close kill chains at speed and at scale, because we're looking at a much bigger battle space. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I think that you know, Lucky, you bring up a good point. It's something that we can we can go back and and glean lessons from for how we operated in Coin, right? And so all of those aircraft that were then executing effects both over Afghanistan and then over Syria, those all all those aircraft came from different locations within the Middle East, like, like we know. And so there there are things that we can now take a look at now. What it's going to look like for an Indo-PACOM fight where we know mm -hmm. that we're going to have forces disaggregated. You know, we, there's some good lessons that we can learn there and, and bring into our practices. And and thankfully, as you look at some of the exercises that we're already doing uh, back home for our, our current training, we are bringing in those concepts so that we can you know, build off of those lessons learned from, from the coin fight. Yeah. And as you're moving those little chess pieces around the battle space, because you have that bigger picture and that broader knowledge that maybe somebody in a single seat cockpit doesn't, that's going to make you far more effective at not only ensuring that you've got coverage across the scope of the battle space, but that you're also placing the right, uh, the right aircraft in the right places at the right time so that they can execute their function to be able to close kill chains. Manage your money on your time with 24-7 digital banking on the PenFed mobile app. Easily make payments, transfer funds, and deposit checks through mobile deposit. And that's music to my ears. Learn more at PenFed.org. Federally insured by NCOA. So with this bigger battle space we've talked about, we know we've got major zones of enemy defenses that will shape who and what can be over bad guy land in a big way. So in the past, AWACS and JSTARS had to fly within the region that was assigned to their mission area, and their sensors could only reach so far. And this talks a little bit about putting the right things in the right place at the right time. Um, if you wanted more battle management, you needed to flow more aircraft and crews into that space. But the Pacific is a really big place, and we'll need a lot of battle management. So how is this shaping your architecture, how you're going to operate, um, and the number of sensors and platforms and, frankly, just aircraft that you've got? Yeah, Lucky, I think 
like other communities within the Air Force, uh, the battle management community is, is, is quickly learning that the ty tyranny of distance is real. And so it's something that, that has to be accounted for, and that's something that we're looking at. Uh, what that means is, of course, basing options are going to have to be thought out uh, pretty well. We're going to need the support uh, at some of those basing options that, that maybe a fighter aircraft won't need, just based on the size and footprint that you're going to have with both aircraft that are performing battle management, mm -hmm. but also not to you know leave out the fact that you're going to have to have ground-based battle managers there to help support any type of mission out in, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and so when you're looking at those locations, all the things need to be accounted for. Um, you know, we hear about the ACE model for, for fighter aircraft, and it's not that um, the E3 or, or ground-based crews can't perform ACE-like functions, but we're, we're more adaptable than we are agile. <laughs> I like that. But uh, like I said, the 552 Air Control Wing there at Tinker Air Force Base, uh, which where your E3s are located, of course, and then, mm -hmm. and then of course, the 461st, where we're both looking at ways in which that we can um, – fit into what that indo pacom pipe is going to look like and, and then glean lessons uh, learned from, you know, from World War II. Um, it's critical, though, that the U.S. Air Force finds ways to uh, strategically approach this this problem and not cut out uh, battle management platforms from the models in which they're employing within the Pacific. So we've already seen, you know, various different fifth gen aircraft flying around, uh, conducting different flyings to these different islands. I, I would argue that we need to start seeing uh, the pairing of battle management platforms and capabilities so that we can build up those TTP now as opposed to waiting for game day and then try to put those forces in place and not have the relevant uh, knowledge of how best to position uh, our forces, but also what the timeline is going to look like. What are the things that are going to be that are going to trip us up with regards to logistics that we're going to need in order to support the employment of those aircraft from various locations within the Pacific? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that we're uh, in the 461st, we've made, you know, my wing leadership has made some big changes to get after the maneuverability in the Pacific and giving our combat commanders options. And we're obviously focused a lot more on the, the ground side of this. Um, and I know the 552 Air Control Wing has the, their air control group as well with the CRCs. They're making big changes. But on the 461st side, we're exploring concepts in the BCC, which the BCC has been traditionally a, a brick and mortar facility that does control through sensors that have been piped back in. Its origin really traces back to SAGE and the big block buildings, although we're a lot smaller than that now. Uh, with a lot bigger data pipes, we're exploring a concept that I'm kind of dubbing digital maneuverability. I know I'm not the first to say that, but it's it may be the first application into the BCC we've talked about. And that's how do I integrate different comm methods and sensors that, that might traditionally belong to somebody else, put it through some sort of track generator or AI that then puts a, a common picture together that I can utilize and so let's not forget that one of the earliest battle management systems and, and SAGE, its radars are now under the control of the FAA primarily. I mean, they're Homeland Defense radars. The Air Force put a lot of them out there that now feed our air traffic control um, that a lot of our airmen are very familiar with. It's not unreasonable to think that we could leverage sensors like that that are already out in an AOR, given the right digital access to them uh, to allow us to, to control battle space effects. So civilian systems our own in, in native systems, other service systems, things of that nature, some of our joint and coalition partner systems that could feed into the BCC and increase our awareness. Enhanced digital maneuverability uh, will definitely allow us to close some of these major distance gaps in both communication and in sensing. Yeah, and I, I think the you know the big takeaway from this is the U.S. Air Force, in my opinion, is is attempting to be strategically predictably unpredictable. Like we're seeing our forces flow within these different locations, which again, the PRC kind of knows where our aircraft traditionally have operated in the Pacific. And so, you know, while there are fiscal constraints with moving around uh, a larger footprint with regards to battle management platforms, it is important that we involve battle management platforms in this predictable, uh, predictably unpredictable strategy that we're trying to implement. So what I'm hearing both of you say is essentially um, not only will you have the aircraft like uh, right now, the, the E3, as well as in the future, the E7, uh, moving around uh, and within the battle space. But this also, Big Bobby, allows you to take information that's coming off of any platform, whether or not that's a collaborative combat aircraft, so like a drone or a fifth generation aircraft, or in the future space systems, and integrate that into a battle space picture that you, then you can manage and orchestrate the battle from any place at any time. I mean, that's definitely a direction that we're trying to go. I mean, we're, we're not there yet. I mean, and we need, we need a lot of help to get there too, but that's the concept. I mean, if we're already paying for that sensor to be out there, why can't we integrate it into something um, that can help 
feed that common operational picture for a battle manager to do their job from. Same with comm systems that are out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the time and space in the Pacific is going to be so precious uh, that we're going to have to leverage everything that we're spending our, our, our precious resources on getting out there and protecting. And so what I'm advocating for is, and what we're exploring in the BCC is, how do I get that to my console? How can I leverage that? Yeah, because if if someone if someone is seeing it, if any blue force is seeing it, you should be seeing it too. But I think one thing that you said, Big Bobby, that's really important is although this is your aspiration and the direction that you're moving in, it's not there yet. And so we still need to have a hedging force, the E3, the E7, to ensure that we have known capabilities, known airplanes that can be where they need to be with the battle managers on board because we've got mature TTPs and we know that we can execute that mission today as opposed to having to wait for this aspirational project to to materialize at some point in the future. So Absolutely. This, we're going to need all of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're going to need all, all of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All of it. Um, so like I say, all the airplanes. Um, so but this also brings up the notion of data saturation, right? So if you're if you're taking if anybody that sees anything, you're able to integrate that capability. You need to make sure that you're not getting that data saturation. Um, so, and I know that I've heard folks that have flown combat, you know, recently say, "Hey, I got this. I don't need Big Brother Battle Manager dumping my SA." Right. So things are going to be far more complex when folks are shooting. We've got massive sorties in play, and the battle space is really dynamic. We've got the adversary deliberately trying to dump our situational awareness. So this data saturation is going to be a huge challenge. What does this mean for battle management? So, Lucky, let's think about what we really need all of this data to turn into. You know, we really need it to turn into an intelligence product that sees that commanders can make decisions off of. And we need it to turn into targets that a battle manager can can track and manage an ID and a target that a pilot or a bomber or, or bomber pilot or any other pilot can ultimately kill while defending themselves effectively. And I think AI has some major play here, um, consolidating information to what is needed to make critical decisions at the appropriate level. Uh -huh. A pilot doesn't actually want to know everything that's going on in the battle <laughs> yeah. space. Um, you know, like they, I've heard that a lot, like, well, I want to know, I want to see, and I want to know everything. No, you need to I know see. what's relevant for your mission. Otherwise it's, it can be data dumping. You Absolutely. Know. Or, I mean, I would offer for them to come look at my console during a red flag push one day. And I'll tell you that you don't want to know everything that I see on that console because you, you don't need it for your particular role. They just need the pieces that really apply to their mission and the threats that are going to keep them from accomplishing their mission. Mm -hmm. And at the next echelon up, I need that same type of information, but for different reasons, and maybe not at the same level of detail. So for example, a pilot needs to know like what specific threat they're up against so they can put down an effective counter tactic down to like what type of missile is being shot at them. Um, at the battle management level, I may not need to know that at the same time the pilot does because I can look forward or look at a different place. I need to know the disposition of the total force and who's being engaged across the entire operational uh, operational area. Both the pilot and the battle manager are processing large amounts of data, but for fundamentally different reasons. And AI can really help us streamline what's shown and, and what's shown to who, and more importantly, when it's needed to be shown. That's actually a really important point. Swat? Yeah, I couldn't agree with more with what Big Bobby said. I'll, I'll also mention, as we, we've talked previously about you know the need to recapitalize, Currently, when you talk about the E3, the bandwidth doesn't exist to even run some of these programs that the Air Force is looking at. And so while it is important that we develop those, because we're going to need those to, to battle manage in the future, we have to also remember that uh, currently, like, you don't have the bandwidth on the E3 to load up this program and run it real time in the background. You know, we're going to be degraded in that sense until we can get either one, better, you know, hardware that will allow for uh, increased bandwidth, or two, the onboarding of, of the E7 that's going to have that fifth generation communication capability and bandwidth to allow us to run some of these important AI programs that are going to help us battle manage in the future. Yeah, you know, it, it, when we talk about AI, everyone likes to sprinkle AI around, but we don't always realize the size of the processing and the the, the, the swap C, so the size, weight, power, cooling, that's necessary to run this. Now, you can actually take some AI programs and neck them down so they're much lighter in terms of what a software load would actually be. But it's important that as we talk about what we will need, what kind of processing, what kind of filters we'll need in the future, that we think about where that processing will physically exist and how accessible that will be for the battle managers. So if we go on a sortie 20 years from now, like, so like let's chunk a rock and just go into our, our future, future uh, way forward machine. 
Let's say CCAs are a major player in the battle space, and we've got rapidly composing and decomposing kill chains. So we're assembling kill chains. They're coming together. They're aggregating to complete a particular kill chain, and then they're dispersing, right? And we're using long-range weapons for certain missions. We're over the Pacific, and the bad guy threats are real. They're prolific, and they're, they're super bad. What's a battle manager doing in this world? Yeah, look, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be completely dissimilar from what was going on in Desert Storm. Obviously, a different character with regards to the technology that we're going to have to bring to bear against an adversary. But, you know, the core functions of the Air Force are going to be at play again for the first time probably since Desert Storm. And, and so battle management platforms will have to be focused on conducting functions that are going to support the achievement of air superiority by our fighter forces. But unlike Desert Storm, what has to occur uh, is going to be the, the continued investment and recapitalization of, of those forces as we move forward uh, closer to that 2027 line that we've heard put in the sand by some of our leaders uh, to ensure that 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 our battle managers on these platforms can achieve uh, in conjunction with our fighter pilots air superiority that's needed uh, to fight uh, in in the Indo-Pacific. So I'd like to toss this out here to, to both y'all because we've heard senior leaders talk about how challenging the threat environment will be within the Pacific and frankly for any peer threat, whether or not that's China or Russia. And so there's a desire to move beyond the E7 and transition all of these sensors to space. So you'd essentially have completely disaggregated on the ground battle management with no air breathing JSTARS replacement. GMTI is going wholly to space, uh, potentially AMTI as well. So the air moving target indicator. So very limited E7s and, and relying primarily on LEO constellations to provide all of the sensing that we would need from space. What what do you make of this? What do you make of these vectors? And remember, we're, we're looking at the future, right? We're in our, our way forward machine. Yeah, look, yeah, I'd say two words, layered effects. So the reason that the Air Force should be uh, very interested in onboarding an aircraft like the E-7 is that we will still need the ability to have layered effects uh, in the battle space. And what I mean by that is, uh, while we we don't know the maturity of our space based effects, we hope that those come on mm -hmm. online soon, and, and and I want those things as a battle manager. But we also understand that the adversary can contest domains, and they can contest domain multiple domains at once. And so, uh, if we if the Air Force decides to go away from the onboarding of the seven, I think we open ourselves to some risks there um, uh, within the domains of being able to contest space. And now, where do we get this information? Um, so that's what I'd say. Layer effects is the first thing. Exactly, SWAT. I mean, I don't think it's smart for us to put all of our eggs in one basket. And I think there are some crucial components that an air-based battle management can provide us that potentially space-based might not. And that has to do with latency, with precision, and so forth. And so having the ability to layer those capabilities provides us a level of resiliency and um, allows us to cross-check our information. So even if they weren't to totally take out our constellations, we can ensure that we can cross-check and make sure we've got accurate information as well. Yeah, and, and Lucky, I want to I pile onto this layered effects thing uh, here as well. You know, what the E7 gives you is options. It's, it's you know, what do you need in warfare? You need options. Combatant commanders need ways to maneuver when the enemy starts to vote. And so by having space-based effects or having space-based sensors, that's an option a combatant commander has at a persistence the taxpayer can afford. Um, the E7, it gives the combatant commander options to push to the edge of the battle space when the environment allows for it or when it's needed to get an effect in a time and place. And so you know, we never take away these options. And we also need to think about, uh, and I would challenge um, some of our, our strategic thinkers and planners in the service right now to, to think about how to use the E7 differently than we use the E3 because technology allows for it. There is no reason why you couldn't land an E7 somewhere and operate it from the ground if the environment per, uh, was, was permissive enough for it or that's what was needed. We're going to have to think differently about some of our C2 sensors and the battle managers need to think differently about how to employ them uh, to give that maximum value and flexibility. But no, we do not want to put all of our eggs in one total basket because it takes away the options that commanders are going to need. And I think importantly, we also can't forget about the ground-based sensor and bringing on that tip before to complement both the, the E7 and then also any space-based effects. We're going to need that that layered uh, capability as you go from the forward edge of the battle space back to uh, where forces are being generated on, whether that be islands or air bases uh, across the world. And that, and that kind of reason for my final point here on this topic is we can't, like we did with COIN, get pigeonholed into a acquisition and 
feeling of a force that is met for one specific mission. And so Amen. what we have to do is ensure that uh, and realize not every conflict is going to be like the Indo-Pacific or like COIN. And we need to build a force where we can achieve our superiority with the support of battle management platforms and, and technology that can go and fight any adversary anywhere on the world uh, when needed. Absolutely. You know, and, and in addition to that, just again, to pile on even more is we're still seeing um, some some friction between uh, national space agencies and the military and the space force regarding control of assets and control of information. So I think it'll be crucial to that um, that we have that flexibility across the force. Now, Bobby, you're a battle manager for the first time without an aircraft in your career because the E-8 would sunset. So the mission you're executing today is part of this new build of the future. And can you explain the paradigm that you're trying to construct? Well, lucky, you know, my team is helping to define the role of, you know, I mentioned the BCCs earlier and I talked a little bit about its origin, um, but we're really looking to define the role of what I'm calling an expeditionary BCC. And so BCCs have lived in, in the Homeland Defense mission for many, many years. Our guard brothers and sisters have been manning that post really since you know, the end of World War II. Uh, and BCCs are fundamentally cheaper to operate at a near indefinite persistence, which is why that they have been very well suited for that Homeland Defense mission. Um, this concept is really easy to understand there, but it's a lot harder to grasp when you talk about bringing effects to your enemy outside of our borders, which generally speaking, the U.S. Air Force likes to fight away games uh, whenever we can. And so with the advent of modern data communication uh, and, and, and communication capabilities, there's now an ability for a fixed site like a BCC to access the information that's needed uh, to control effects in an expeditionary environment. But there are some trade-offs here. Um, mobility equals survivability in a physical domain. Uh, we're always going to need sensors and comms that exist under that red threat umbrella. So, you know, that's where we start talking about these, these new ground-based sensors and the E7, you know, being able to push forward and go out there and give us, um, give us options. Uh, the problem is, is that it's, it's very expensive to do this uh, in mass and for a really long period of time, which is what we really learned in the Middle East. And that's really how the concept of our expeditionary BCC came into being, is it started out as a mobile system okay. and eventually, like as I like to say, like just grew roots where it was and has actually slowly migrated uh, back to the States. Um, <clears throat> so what the BCC is going to allow is a form of digital maneuverability uh, for with sensors of fleeting persistence to aggregate their information uh, to a location that doesn't always have to move to survive. And we could do this at a cost that allows us to continually leverage the effects against the enemy. And so I wanna emphasize that I do not think that the PCC competes with the need to buy the TOC kits, the TOC L, the TOC M that the 552 is dealing with, mm -hmm. uh, or the E7. Rather, it's gonna work together and let us make more efficient use of the information at a cost that's absolutely bearable. So it sounds like a big challenge with the BCCs and in the, the construct, the paradigm that you're describing is really about connectivity, right? Because it's very networked and it relies on, upon assured information and comms beyond line of sight. So how do we minimize those vulnerabilities? And I'll just highlight the reason why we made fifth generation systems so organic, right? They're, they're, they're self-contained kill chains with everything on board was the ability to be able to execute their missions to close their kill chains, even if they were cut off from comms. But now we're going the other way big time. And when you look at disaggregated forces as well, that's kind of like a, a double whammy, if you will. Yeah. And, you know, this is where we're really going to, and I say we, you know, the U.S. Air Force is really going to rely on our, our cyber warriors. You know, that's something that we're bringing up in the 461st ACW all the time is re-imaging what we thought an air control network squadron, which used to do the software support really for the E-8 and reimagining what they do and the type of support they provide for the BCCs. And I know that squadron at Robbins has been doing a lot of work in that department. And so, you know, with this ability to aggregate lots of information, you know, there is an inherent survivability of that. That's lots of points that have to be attacked to bring it down, but it, we're still very dependent on those networks. And so we need our cyber defenders. We need those folks to preserve the, our ability to do our jobs. S similar efforts underway within the 552 and, okay. and the ACNS squadron that is supporting the E3, uh, exactly what Big Bobby talked about, where we're looking at ways in which uh, they can provide that, that cyber security uh, for the platform to ensure there's no vulnerabilities. So this battle management is all about massive data flows and making sense of them to the point of turning it into actionable information at tactically relevant speeds and at tactically relevant scales. Or in certain cases, Bobby, you've talked about this, operationally or strategically relevant scales. 
But bottom line, that's a ton of data. And we've talked about data saturation. How might these AI tools help you as battle managers? And how do we best team humans with AI to effectively manage theater and tactical operations? Okay, so like I mentioned previously, you know, I think there are a lot of possibilities for AI tools, and we're seeing some companies out there like AFWorks that are putting some of these things out. We've Big Bobby and I both have experience in the desert working with like the tanker management tool as an example, where we're bringing in some of these abilities to make uh, processes more efficient. But I think, uh, as I mentioned previously, the the big the big piece of this is going to be ensuring that these these technologies are able to be run on on the platforms that are not only fielded today, but can then be scaled uh, to be more efficient on on the platforms that we're looking to acquire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I think really AI is going to help tremendously with the tracking and identification of red and blue assets. And this is referred to, you know, in our business as the cop or the common operating picture. And really what it comes down to, Lucky, is the better quality of the cop, the better quality of the battle management and the decision makings that come with it. And AI has got a tremendous about a uh, tremendous amount of play here. Yeah. If you don't have the right situational awareness, you're going to take the wrong action. So that that, like you said, the cop is is key. So where is the human still important? We know uh, artificial intelligence does have limits. We've talked about hallucinations and, and errors before, even when you get data that's well outside of the algorithm. So even if you're able to train out any of these issues, an enemy can understand and defeat the logic. So humans can often make sense of the unpredictable, and we can also be unpredictable ourselves. What do you see the value of humans in the future? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to get just a little philosophical here, you know, but really war is and always is going to be a human endeavor and we are always going to need humans in the loop to accept risks and make decisions while balancing interests uh, not just in the Air Force, not just in the military, but uh, really across the dime. Machines are going to aid in the decision making. They're going to help us calculate risk, but they're not going to be the ones ultimately living with the consequences of their actions. Humans will and will always need to have the final say. You know, and I agree with you, Big Bobby. Uh, humans have the ability to be unpredictable. We can improvise. We can chunk the rock even through uncertainty. And also, when it comes to battle management, I can foresee the the potential for a battle manager to make a suboptimal decision right now because they're preserving forces or preserving options for the future. So I think there's an element where there's an art to war that battle managers really understand that we may not be able to to program in. So this brings me to how do we train and also how do we retain battle managers for the future? We're moving to concepts like joint all domain command and control and advanced. We've got the advanced battle management system and battle managers in my mind are going to be key to operational success, but the eras of transition can be pretty turbulent. How do we teach these tenants and make space to innovate for new technologies and tools while also keeping the morale of the folks alive so they still want to continue to serve in this role. I mean, it's hard when people see their beloved aircraft retire, replacements aren't coming fast enough, and there's not a really clear articulation of why their function, why their specialty is valued. Lucky Shaq, I think the first thing we have to realize is that change is the constant in the Air Force. Uh, as you go back to 1947, and, and really before that, the, as the advent of, of the air weapon kind of came onto the scene, mm -hmm. even the air theorists of, of Trenchard, uh, Duhay, Mitchell, all of those folks and the core concepts that air power still executes today were, were present then. It's just that we've changed the character and how which we can go forth and do those things based on the technology that, is, that has gotten better. Second, I would say that for our battle managers, we need to focus on the things we can control. So I can't control budgetary processes. I can't control acquisition timelines. But what we can control as battle managers is how we are in our craft. And that's going to be mastering those four tenets that we talked about and ensuring that we have the battle management teams ready to go um, should should our name you know number be called and, and we get put out on the field. And so taking advantage of the exercises that we have, the the, the flights and, and training events that we have to ensure that the battle managers are ready to go is going to be is going to be critical. Um, and we need to be focused specifically on training towards that near peer. You know, in the past, Big Bobby and I spent a lot of time not necessarily focused on our near peer competitors because we were, you know, executing real world operations, uh, you know, around yeah, the globe. Yeah, you're doing the JOB. That's right. And so now is the time that we need to be really focused on, you know, should we be asked to go to the Pacific or into Europe, making sure that our, our, our teams are ready to go uh, in that, in the, in making sure our teams are ready to face those potentialities.
Yeah, and lucky I'll echo all the sentiments that SWAT just laid out. The only addition is is that you know when we retired aircraft, we parted ways with more than just the sensor. I know I mentioned it, but I can't I can't not keep mentioning it. Um, it we parted away with the operations floors, the battle managers, uh, for them to practice their craft and to get better at those skills that are going to be needed. Uh, we desperately need environments and the equipment that let us iterate with the advances in technology and continue to grow out that skill set as we move towards that future. And, and one unique thing about about our community is that the the battle management skill set is transferable between platforms, right? So as I mentioned, you know, I have E3 operators as divestment heads. I need to find new locations for them. Well, hey, I can send them over to Big Bobby and they can start executing battle management within the BCC. So uniquely uh, equipped to be able to basically transfer that skill set between platforms without having to do a massive transition course like you would see from a, a, a pilot going from an, an F-22 to an F-16 or vice versa. Yeah, that's a really good point. But Big Bobby, as you said, I mean, key to that and key to not only their expertise and their proficiency, but also their morale is having the operations floors for them to be able to execute their craft and to practice their craft. And if they don't have those opportunities to be able to do that, we not only risk um, you know, their, them losing their proficiency, but we also risk losing their morale and also losing the personnel writ large. So yeah. if you gentlemen, oh, yeah. I just oh. want to pile onto that. Yeah, quick. totally. The, the calf is also missing out on training with the people that they're going to be fighting hand in hand with too. Um, you know, so as we're, you know, if we're not there, the, the pilots aren't used to having us around. And so what's it going to look like on game day when we show up uh, or, you know, a worse for simulated or simulated poorly. And so, you know, there's something to be said for that too. And I know that there's digital environments we're working in. I know that there's been some advancements in the DMO area, um, but, you know, we need we need more of that cowbell so we can keep working with our, our partners. You're losing the connective tissue that is important to generate a good team. And so, you know, like we talked about previously, that this is why it is critical that if, that if we are going to continue to focus on the Pacific, which I think correctly we should, uh, that you are incorporating battle management professionals in some of those events where we're sending aircraft on the road in order to develop not only TTP for the U.S. Air Force, but in conjunction with our allies. So bringing in the Australians, uh, like we've seen already done, uh, in, in including the E3, the, the CRC, BCC play into those events is what's going to create that team that's ready to go. Those are excellent points, SWAT. So, gentlemen, let's say you've got a few minutes with senior leaders and you're charting the future for your mission area. Uh, what final thoughts would you like to offer? Yeah, Lucky, just like the RAF initially demonstrated during the Battle of Britain, the importance of battle management is paramount. And I think the last time that the U.S. Air Force was really capitalized on those effects was Desert Storm. It was the last fight that was traditional in the sense of well, we're not going and doing you know, a counterinsurgency mission where air superiority is assumed. I would say that uh, we need to ensure that our management platforms are capable of exploiting the layered multi-domain sensors that are going to be the bedrock to that future fight. Additionally, uh, the faster our battle management platforms can get to that fifth generation, make that fifth generation leap, the better. And so, again, we're, we're working against budgetary cycles, uh, but it is important that we, we apply the money where we need to in order to ensure that air superiority can be achieved. Because if we can't, uh, I think we're going to be in for uh, you know a tough fight there, uh, not only in the Pacific, but anywhere else uh, potentially on the globe. And I'd say, finally, uh, we can no longer make or allow battle management to be a planning assumption. And so too often, you know, we, we send aircraft forward. There is no inherent battle management capability like we just kind of talked about, ensuring that the teams are there to, to practice together. We need to ensure that the Air Forces, as we're moving forward, in order to achieve the effect of air superiority, we're going to need battle managers paired with our combat capability to achieve uh, that, that desired end state. You know, the last thing I would close with is, interestingly, every other core Air Force mission right now has either a MAF or a MAGCOM associated with it. Now, I'm not sitting here abdicating that we need to change that. I know that the, the chief is coming out with a new design on, on the force, but just something that I think is pretty interesting. In the next fight, air superiority will not be achieved without air battle management. Mm -hmm. Our battle management professionals and the senior leaders equipping their capabilities must be ready. Uh, and no better example exists than to look at what the Chinese and the PLA are doing with their force right now. And so you have iterations of battle management capability in the form of the KJ-2000, the KJ-500, the KJ-600, the KJ-3000, Point being, the Chinese have iterated on four platforms, and we are still operating today, presently, with platforms that were fielded in the late 70s and early 80s. Yeah, I will echo everything that SWAT said. And and really, you know, what I would say to my senior leaders, uh, if, I had a, if I had a second with them in the elevator, whether it be on the civilian side or the military side, is ultimately they want options. You know, they want, they want a system that they can trust, that can carry out their intent. Um, and a, a very effective multi-layer battle management system gives them those options. 
I'll tell you that it's going to take an investment, but it is an investment that's in a force multiplier. You can buy an F-22, you can pair it with a battle management team, and that F-22 is going to be more lethal and its weapons are going to be used better. Um, and I tell my squadron, you know, when I sit down in training meetings with these young lieutenants and captains that are hungry to get after their skill set, uh, the way I motivate them to get after the, the the practicing that we can do is, is that we are saving lives now. Um, we are saving lives now in, in how we're iterating on our battle management systems, the decisions that we're making, the practice that we're putting in. And so, you know, I'll just leave them with that, that they're going to want options. They're going to scale. They're going to want flexibility. And we need a place to practice. Amen. It, as I started out this episode, we are huge fans of battle management. And every time I talk with you gentlemen, I am just more convinced that that's going to be crucial, essential um, cornerstone of our combat operations and our success. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, luckily. Great conversation. Looking forward to doing it again sometime. Yep. As usual, happy to be back. And as you could tell, I'm super passionate about this subject. So anytime you want to talk about it. You bet. So are we, Big Bobby. Thanks so much. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to you, our listeners, for your continued support and for tuning into today's show. If you like what you heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you would like us to explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at MitchellAerospacePower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great aerospace power kind of day. See you next time. And one of the things in our community that kind of pops up occasionally is, is we we still have this weird thing where we all think we're competing against each other for resources, which I understand where that comes from. Um, but I told SWAT when I was out at Bamboo Eagle, I was like, I don't see the BCC competing with the top L for anything. Like, in fact, I want more of you. Like, why would I not? No, I think you said it perfectly earlier when you talked about uh, we will need all three capabilities. And by the capabilities, I mean an airborne capability in the form of the E-7. And then the two ground capabilities where you have the deployable uh, TOC enabled CRC and then also the deployed in place BCC. Like those three capabilities are going to are going to be what we need in the future uh, to conduct battle management because we all bring unique things to the fight. Um, and it's just like when you talk about the the fighter side of the house, we don't just have an F-22 or a F-35. We combine those things, F-35, F-22 with F-15Es, F-15EX, F-16, et cetera, A-10, to be able to, to go force package and go bring an effect. And so I think it's a very similar conversation when you start talking about battle management platforms.